All right, now this first slide, I don't know that you necessarily need to take any notes over it, but it's gonna look an awful lot like what we just did in chapter six through eight with scatter plots, because here's our old friend explanatory variable and response variable, but I promise you, no scatter plots, no R, no R squared, no residual plots, nothing like that, no ordered pairs. But in an experimental situation, since you will be a person who will be you know, imposing something, inputting something into the process, then we're talking that input is an independent variable or an explanatory variable. That's something you're familiar with. And then once you have imposed that treatment, you then sit back and check for an effect or what is the response to it. So that becomes a response variable. So there is a kind of uh, explanatory and response variable relationship here, all right? Because what you input into an experiment hopefully will explain anything that obs that's observed that's a result of it. And anything you observe or response that you get is responding to that input or explanatory variable. So just, yeah, there's a lot of connections in statistics. This happens to be one of them. Uh, really no need to take uh, notes here necessarily. These are just observational studies. These are what we've been doing. That's where you get your clipboard. Don't really make anything happen. Don't impose anything. Just walk in, check out the situation, write down your data, see if there's any meaning to things. We also had a pilot study, retrospective, prospective. The one thing though that we did not talk about were case studies. and. So let me just kind of highlight what those are. So let's just say you encounter a person who has some kind of physical issue, maybe an illness that's really, really rare, or some kind of genetic thing that's really, really, really rare. And it's so rare, it's to the point that there may be four or five cases in the whole world. And But that's a field you want to look into, you want to make a difference, because it isn't zero for the number of people that get it. So um, you can't make a group. There's just one person near you. Maybe the other four or five are on the other side of the planet. So um, you just go ahead and agree with this person that you will track what they do, You know how the illness is progressing, if it's getting better, if it's not, what the person is doing to try to improve things, what can work, what won't, so that you can examine those notes later on and maybe derive some meaning from it or perhaps even instigate a cure but that is like a study of one person all right because that's just case by case so case study all right experiments i got two definitions for you they basically say the same thing okay as a researcher you're going to purposefully or deliberately impose some treatment on individuals in order to observe their responses, to see if there's an effect, what the response is, then figure out what to do with it. Alternately, it's a research situation in at least one, in which at least one variable, your experimental variable, is deliberately manipulated or varied by the researcher. All right, so you can see the active nature that you have with experiments as opposed to the passivity you would have for observational studies. All right, so some terms. Um, experimental units, that's just a broad general kind of term for any uh, individuals that you perform an experiment on or that upon which the experiment is done. If, however, the experimental units happen to be human beings, people, then I will refer to them as subjects. So if I ask you, all right, tell me what the subjects are for that experiment, you know, it might not just be people, it might be women, could be men, could be children, it could be old people, young people, you know, it could be different ethnicities, whatever, all right? But they're still all people. Um, otherwise, uh, they're just experimental units. That's kind of generic. Okay, here is where you probably need to focus your attention. Maybe write a few things down or at least 
really take this in at a deep level. So there's going to be factors, uh, different terms rather, including factors, and they're going to seem to overlap and they won't make much sense until I show you some organizers where you can kind of distinguish what's what. So starting with factors, you notice it says explanatory variables. Well, explanatory variables are inputs. And if you're the researcher, that is what you're imposing. So that is whatever variable you are putting into the experiment. It's going to be a broad umbrella and there'll be factors or a factor. It could be more than one. All right. And since it is a broad umbrella, within that umbrella is a set of related conditions or categories. Okay. So a factor is one broad category of a lot of other things. So for instance, if, um, if I'm using just the factor drug as my explanatory variable in an experiment, what I'm imposing, it might be that I'm actually going to go beyond that and impose drug A, drug B, drug, drug C, and maybe a sugar pill, all right? Those are just a sub groupings within a factor, right? Those are a set of related conditions and they would be called levels. So within factors are going to be levels. It's a little bit more specific. Um, yeah, if you are the person who is in the experiment, you're going to kind of be interested in the treatments because that's coming to a, you know, to a home near you. All right. So these are ex specific experimental conditions applied to the units. So it could be aspirin, it could be a new kind of running shoe, it could be a type of gasoline for cars, it could be an ingredient that you mix in to, with others to make bricks to see if you can't get the weathering to slow down, whatever, okay? Now keep in mind you can have more than one factor and each of those factors can have levels so suddenly those levels interact. So we may have to look at combinations of specific levels from all the factors in order to identify treatments. So here is the um, organizer that will help you to see it. Okay, this is about as simple of an experiment as you can possibly get. You have one factor. Let's just say this is for um, migraine headaches. Uh, that's a pretty bad plague for a lot of people and it's hard to fix that. It's hard to get people well from migraines. So we're going to try um, drug. Drug is our overall factor and within that factor may be ibuprofen. Drug B might be some new um, formulation that we're looking to see if it has any uh, efficacy and then maybe a sugar pill. Well this is a one-dimensional experiment with one factor so all of the levels become the treatments, right? So control is a treatment, it needs a group. Drug A is a treatment, it needs a group. Drug B is a treatment and so on, it needs a group, okay? So uh, one factor, three levels, three treatments. And yeah, you're gonna need three groups. Now keep in mind that uh, and this is uh, shown a little bit better on uh, the PowerPoint we did in class. But for this particular thing, if I ask you to diagram the experiment, it will not look like this. This is merely an organizer for planning purposes. Our um, diagrams are more like flow diagrams from left to right. They can be, you know, um, replaced with a paragraph if you want to, you know, describe a an experiment with a paragraph, but you will not put this organizer up here. Okay, just don't. All right, so we're going to get a little more complicated with the next one. And I want to just throw this out there. If you do a, you know, graduate level course in research methods, uh, experimental design can get crazy hard. You know, you can have many factors and many levels and all kinds of things. And you know, it's amazing to think that people can actually design those things, but we're going to keep it to Experiments 101, and while we'll get a little bit more sophisticated by the end of it, it will not be beyond what you would learn as a freshman level stats person, which is what you are. 
All right, so let's bump up the factors. Now we're going to have two factors. All right, so here's the first one, just like in the previous example, drug and control A and B, C. This part of the table looks the exact same, but now we've got the physical state of the patient. Thinking that, you know, the way a person is, whether they're refreshed or tired, may have some effect on their how they experience pain. So physical state, tired and rested, and this goes into a contingency table. So we're into two dimensions, right? So when you look at the groups that you're going to assign, keep in mind that you're going to see the interaction of the two factors and their levels. So group two, for example, these are all the tired people that are on drug A. And group six are all the rested people that are taking drug B, right? So Group three, drug B and tired. Group four, rested and control. See the and? All right, so in order to figure out you know, how many treatments you've got, because all six of these are unique, it's just the two times the three. So three times two is six treatments, and each treatment requires a group. So there you go. Um, if you have three factors, that would imply a three-dimensional organizer and four or five would even go beyond that so we're probably not going to go beyond just the two okay so keep in mind this is not a an experimental design this is merely an organizer so why bother with experiments well experiments can give you good evidence for causation and that's important remember scatter plots didn't do it observational studies didn't do it but experiments can do it. If you run the procedures right and you're very careful, then you're gold. You can say, okay, my input caused that output. And the major thing we're looking at today is confounding. So we're gonna study the specific factors we're interested in, and we're going to control the effects of your confounding variables. You're gonna hold constant that which is of no interest to us. So here's the thing. If we can control for all other sources of variation, then really the only other explanation for an effect or an outcome that you would see in an experiment would be what you put into it, would be the treatments. So it's, um, is there's no magic to it. You just make sure there's no other confounding present and there isn't any other, any other reason for why your um, ex uh, response variable is seeing effects to it than your explanatory variable or what you've imposed. Again, we've already seen that experiments can allow us to study the combined effects of several factors. So you know what, if you're going to interact levels of factors, you know it may be that just a certain combination will be the most effective out of all the possible ones and that will be something you'll be able to spot. So that's what that bulleted point kind of refers to, all right? So um, comparative experiments, this is how we're gonna go about eliminating confounding variables, and we're going to use a control group. Now I'm going to throw out there immediately that you don't have to always have a group called control group. Okay, um, but here in your book, it says for computer software, suppose you wanted to test a $300 piece of software designed to shorten download times. You could just try it on several files and record the download times. But why do that? Because you don't really have a baseline to compare it to. But you probably would want to compare the speed with what would happen without the software installed, right? Such a baseline measurement is called a, a control treatment, and the experimental units to whom it is applied are called the control group. So, back to why I said you don't have to have a group called a control group. It's pretty easy. Let's just say you're trying to do an experiment with a new kind of cattle feed, you know, see if it puts on weight quicker, if it's better for the cattle, and you go ahead and you take a group of cattle and you feed it the traditional food you've always fed them and you take another group and you feed them the new well if you call 
another group, a control group, basically you're not going to feed them at all. And that's not right, okay? So really it's the old traditional food that serves as a baseline. So there is control there and the base, the, um, the traditional food really is the control group. Don't fight to get a third group in there. You've already got a baseline for comparison. You're good to go. Um, control, therefore, is the first principle of statistical design of experiments. There are actually four. So we control sources of variation other than the factors we're testing by making conditions as similar as possible for all the treatment groups. So for those folks that were rested and tired and taking the drugs for their migraines, we would really want them to have the same kind of meals. We would want them to have the same amount of activity, same amount of exercise, same everything, same exposure to screens, right? So if you can standardize all of their activities, then the only thing that could cause an effect would be whether they're rested or tired interacting with their choice of drug. Oh, the old placebo effect. This is a big deal. It's a very big deal. Um, have you ever seen your little brother or sister or some little kid like run into the wall or fall and skin their knee or have some other issue like that? And then suddenly mommy appears out of nowhere and gives them a big kiss on the boo-boo and they're suddenly fine. No more crying. You know, they say, yeah, it hurts, but not that much. Like, where is the medicinal value in that? I, I don't know. But there is something going on that makes that kid feel better, right? And so that is a placebo effect. That's where a subject can respond to any treatment. Any treatment. Kind of spooky. All right. So on page 16 in the book, they talk about ginkgo biloba. And ginkgo biloba was a big deal when I was a little younger. It's really an extract from a special tree in China. It's kind of related to maples. And there was, uh, it, was it would be a some kind of a folk medicine that was supposedly good for old people to keep their memory up, right? I don't think that that's ever been shown to be true, but here's what the book says. It says, in a randomized comparative double-blind placebo-controlled study, they administered treatments to 230 elderly community members. One group received the ginkgo biloba according to the manufacturer's instructions as kind of a supplement. The other received a similar looking placebo. 13 different tests of memory were administered before and after treatment. Now get this. The placebo group showed greater improvement on seven of the tests. Really? Uh, nothing caused a big improvement? The treatment group uh, on the other six. So the treatment group was good at improving memory on half of them and the nothing treatment was good for seven of them. So what does that tell you about that nutritional supplement? Like, it's useless, right? People are getting better, but not beyond the placebo effect, right? All right. Um, it also says on the page, placebo effect is stronger when the placebo treatments are administered with authority or by a figure who appears to be an authority. So slap on your lab coats, people. you got authority. So, quote, doctors, unquote, in white coats generate a stronger effect than salespeople in polyester suits. But the placebo effect is not reduced much even when the subjects know that the effect exists. People often suspect that they've gotten the placebo if nothing happens at all. all right? One of the things that it does say is that sometimes people will develop the same side effects with the placebo that they do with the real medicine. That's weird. What's even stranger beyond that is this is creepy, but there is such a thing as placebo surgery. And as, you know, uh, as morbid as that sounds, I mean, think about a person who is just tormented with illness, but there's no cause for it. There's just nothing wrong with the person, but yet they're sick all the time and they're just getting desperate. And, you know, desperate people can do desperate things. So what you do is you go, okay, great. We have discovered what's wrong with you. All we need is a little surgery to correct your blah, 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 and then you'll be fine. 
So they take the patient into surgery, make sure they're knocked out, cut them open, you know, walk around the room 10 times, and then after a few moments, suture the guy back up and send him out to recovery. And quite often, that person gets better. I, I, you know, it, what can you say? That's a placebo effect. Um, the blinding, we're gonna talk about that a little later, but just as a quick introduction, you don't wanna come out with the pills and start talking to the patients and say, hey Myrtle, guess what? You're getting the good stuff today. Because that will contaminate the experiment. Because Myrtle will think, ooh, I'm gonna get better, and she does, right? Even if it's a sugar pill. Um, for that matter, if you're the researcher, you don't even wanna tell that person who brought the medicine to her what she's getting. So that somebody's gotta know, you would know as the researcher, but keep it to yourself because the placebo effect can ruin everything. That's blinding. In fact, if you tell the person that delivers the medicine too, that's double blind. All right, there is or can be bias in an experiment if you cause systematic favoritism of one outcome. And trust me, it's easy to do. You just don't want to do it, okay? Just allow things to happen, record them, don't make things happen. And you know, I have to say that when experiments are funded by the drug companies themselves, uh, do you suppose they want to hear that their drug doesn't work? You know, and yeah, that's you would want some measure of independence with people that are that are testing drugs. So, um, good experiments require these three things. Actually, four. We've already talked about control to fix the issue of confounding. Uh, we will hit randomization. That'll be another principle of experimental design. And that is to try to help out the situation where if you just grab five people without any kind of random selection, they may all have a characteristic that will influence the outcome of your experiment. If you can, however, pick people at random and spread that characteristic between two groups, then it nullifies. Uh, replication, we'll cover that. Uh, that particular thing, just, you know, would you really want to do an experiment on one person? Because if that one person does improve from whatever you've given them, does that mean everybody will improve? You know, I mean, don't you need more subjects in your experiment? And even then, wouldn't you want to see that experiment just repeated a few times so that we can say, ooh, something really is happening here? because you could see results with, with not enough replication that are just due to chance. All right, um, so for your confounding, if you wanna see if detergent A outcleans detergent B, I don't think what you would wanna do would be to put um, detergent A in one washing machine uh, that's a different make from another one, maybe a different price and then put a detergent B in that other machine? Because at that point, when the clothes come out, how would you know that the cleaner batch was due to the, you know, the detergent that it had or due to the machine? Ideally, what you wanna do is wash a load in a machine, pull it out, change the detergent, and watch, uh, wash a second load in the same machine. That's perfect control, right? So without it, you've, you have confounding. You just cannot tell which was causing one batch clothing to come out cleaner.